A significant component of the Healthcare Administration program revolves around ethics. We're going to address ethics from a communication perspective over the next little while. As healthcare professionals, you've been practicing ethical decision making and putting ethical practice into play throughout your career. As you further develop your skills and take on more and more leadership responsibility, your ethical load is going to continue to grow as well. So what are ethics? There isn't much explicit discussion about ethics in our text, so for this section, I'd like to refer you to the SAGE reference link on Blackboard called 21st Century Communication, a reference handbook. The first page of the handbook provides a great definition of ethics. It says that ethics are the study of values, of what is more or less important, of the good, of the behavioral guidelines and norms. Ethics provides frameworks and tools for recognizing and assessing available options and for differentiating between more or less morally justified pathways in any given situation. So let's step back for a minute and think about some of the ways that communication is being used by leaders. It may involve the use of available resources to convey information, to move, to inspire, to persuade, to enlighten, to connect, all of which are inherently ethical undertakings. Regardless of context, communication involves choice. The extent an individual or group has options available in any given situation means that moral agency is at play. So with moral agency, the relative freedom to choose one's pathway in any given situation comes responsibility. Communication reflects values. In interpersonal communication, our approach is shaped by goals, values, emotions, and perceptions. What is it that we hope to achieve? How do we perceive the other? What are our perceptions of stakeholders' interests? What about our own values, beliefs, and vested interests? How thoroughly have we considered the likely consequences of the interaction to ourself, to others, and to our relationship? Responses to these questions involve elements of choice and reflect values, influenced significantly by each participant's overall state of heart and mind. Unethical communication is one of humanity's most potentially harmful weapons. In interpersonal contexts, it has the power to wound deeply, to undermine connection, and to thwart healthy human development. In organizations, it can be used to support greed and corruption, to bolster tyranny, and to otherwise foster oppression. Historically, it's played a major role in sparking economic injustice, violence, war, and even genocide. At the same time, communication has been instrumental to the pursuits of truth, wisdom, justice, and peace. Communication's powers to hurt and to heal, to repress and to inspire, to betray and to uplift, to oppress and to comfort, to deceive and to enlighten, to wound and to mend, are among the direct links between communication and ethics. Regardless of context, communication involves choice, reflex values, and has consequences. These three key elements of communication form the basis of its ethical makeup. So the features of ethical communications are what one hopes to achieve through the communication, or the ends. While the communicator's goals and the intentions or the ends of communication are important, so too are the means that communicators elect to use. I want to be careful here not to confuse means with methods of communication. Consider, for example, where you're, a situation where you're out shopping with a friend, perhaps, who tries on an absolutely awful outfit that makes them look like a stuffed potato. How do you respond when you hear that question, do you like it? A fully truthful response could be painful to your friend. There are many means available to avoid hurting them in such circumstances. Among these means are lies, or more subtle forms of deception. Of course, these means are inherently ethically suspect. In contrast, by pursuing compassionate and caring means to sharing information truthfully in such circumstances really promises to foster connection, mutual trust, respect, and understanding thereby facilitating fulfillment of communication's constructive potential.
So the features of ethical communications are what one hopes to achieve through the communication, how one chooses to communicate, and the real-world outcomes or the consequences of communication. Given the complexity of life circumstances, predicting consequences with certainty is impossible. The responsibilities that come with moral agency do not require the ability to prophesize in this way. But to be responsible, we do need to provide thoughtful consideration of all the circumstances, particularly from the standpoints of relevant stakeholders. Thus, as moral agents, we all have a responsibility to anticipate likely consequences as a part of the deliberations. We're going to soon get into the mechanics of communication planning, and a significant amount of that work involves putting these considerations into play. But what happens when we don't know what the right thing to do is? We're going to talk for a minute about the principle of veracity. It's really looking at moral direction. So first we need to distinguish between the concept of truth and truthfulness. The pursuit of truth is an important but very complex undertaking. It takes on many forms, such as the proof of verifiable empirical knowledge about the world, to search for a deep transcendent insights and wisdom on the other. What we're focused on is the concept of truthfulness, which is not so much about the capacity to know or disseminate definitive truths, but a reflection of one's integrity. Which brings us to the principle of veracity, which provides a guideline for discerning whether and how to lie or use forms of deception in any given set of circumstances. The first step is to consult with your conscience. In your heart of hearts, do you feel that the use of deception is warranted in the circumstances? What are your true intentions for considering using the deception? Is it the pursuit of justice, fairness, care, or loving kindness? Or is it to seek revenge, power over vulnerable others, or self-aggrandizement? The principle provides four discrete but related steps for discerning whether deception is morally justified in any given in any given case. Among the reasons why truthfulness has the presumption in its favor across communication contexts are the inherent risks associated with lying and other forms of deception. For example, the decision to deceive another inevitably risks compromising the trust that you have that's so critical to enduring relationships. Once undermined, trust is difficult to restore. Similarly, deceiving another, either by lying or through more subtle forms of deception, threatens the shared experience of respect that's at the heart of meaning, meaningful interpersonal connection. The second step calls for careful consideration of your available options. Are there viable, truthful methods available to fulfill your communication goals? Is it possible to pursue the ends without using deception? The third step is to consult with your peers. Often people who share your interests, values, and beliefs can provide valuable insight in this kind of deliberation. Those who are honest, thoughtful, forthright, and caring are especially helpful. If they're not available, even imagining what they would say can be helpful. The fourth step calls for us to shift our perspective from our own to that of the person or people who are being deceived. On this slide, you'll see how the deceived have been promised that he'd be freed as soon as the photo was taken. It was one of the most peaceful trips to the beach ever, but I digress. The test of publicity encourages us to explore how the deceived, those who share their values and interests and members of the broader community, would view the case. If they had all the facts, would they view the deception as morally justified? Would they say it was potentially helpful to the individual, the relationship, and the community in both the short and long term? So let's take this a step further and talk about some of the things that we can do in our communication as leaders to ensure that we're communicating ethically. Something that we can do is to abide by the law. We can abide by the corporate and or professional code of conduct. We tell the truth. We don't mislead. We're clear. And we avoid discriminatory language. We acknowledge assistance from others. What about when we're truly communicating in two-way communications? Ethical dialogue involves 
Attentive listening. We learned about this earlier. It's about keeping an open mind and heart. It's about balanced partiality and critical self-awareness.